Hey fancy folks, welcome to week three of Warfare in the Ancient World. This is unit three. Yeah, I guess it's still technically week three, where we will be talking about the Mycenaean expansion and what the Bronze Age looked like in ancient Greece. This is going to be a geographical area we're going to sit in for a while, so kind of get comfy and cozy and find the lay of the land. Now you'll notice we're backing up in time a little bit. Last week we were talking about the Battle of Kadesh and the reign of Ramses II. Kadesh happens in 1274 BCE, which is towards the end of the period we're talking about here. The Mycenaean expansion starts off around 1500 BCE and it continues until 1150, after which point it starts to fragment and contract a bit. We'll talk about what I mean by fragment and contract later. Now, much like everyone else in the Eastern Mediterranean, Mycenaean Greek folks are part of this larger social network. They're trading goods and services across the sea with the Hittites, the Egyptians, people living in the Levant. They are serving as mercenaries abroad. Uh, the word that we see for them in Hittite records is effectively Achaean or a Kiowa. And they are one of several peoples who serve in uh, Mesopotamian militaries too. They may have fought as part of the forces at Kadesh even. So Mycenaeans did get around a lot farther than these boundaries here. These are the boundaries that represent their area of influence. And notice I'm saying influence and not domination. This is something that we've walked back as historians a little bit. We used to assume that this was a process of conquest and imperialism. Now we are being more cautious because we don't have a smoking gun proof that conquest was the main way through which Mycenaean peoples, that is early speakers of Greek, created this larger civilization structure. But certainly warfare and violence was part of that process. Uh, other processes involve economic and diplomatic ties, kinship networks. So it's a, a little squishier than we used to assume and more informal. But it's also more normal. It's a lot like what we see in Mesopotamia at the same time, um, less so with the Hittites and the Egyptians, who seem to be a bit more um, direct about their control and influence. Okay, so around 1150, just like everywhere else in the Eastern Mediterranean, many things were conspiring to make it difficult to maintain large geographical areas of influence and control. And this was a combination of raids from the Sea Peoples, probably. But the Sea Peoples aren't the only thing that are causing people to move in from the coasts and to fragment their networks and live on a more local, small scale. There seems to have been a shift in climate that caused less reliability in crops, especially for people who weren't lucky enough to live in Egypt, where you have some cushion in the flooding of the Nile but Egypt's feeling the blows from this too. There may also have been waves of illness in combination with famine. There's some indication that um, volcanic eruptions may have been part of the mix here. So there are multiple factors that we are still trying to understand through increasing use of science and archeology. span if you're interested in this, my colleague Michael Lane teaches a class on it. This is also his area of expertise. He's a Mycenae Mycenaeanist who works on Linear B and excavates in a Bronze Age site in Greece. So you should absolutely check out his classes. He'll tell you more if you find this period fun. But we're going to be focusing on just the war warfare stuff because we've only got a week. So that's what we're do doing. So at this 1150 period, we see shrinking areas where these uh, large palace complexes that we're about to look at are not being maintained as much. This seems to go from the borders inward to the center of Mycenaean speaking heartlands, same as we see elsewhere. By the time we get to about 1000 BCE, 
this civilization as it stands in this period has effectively fallen apart. Uh, or at least it's not continuing in a form that looks a lot like what came before. It's not leaving a heavy footprint in the archaeological record. Written records aren't being preserved in the same way. And we don't see evidence of the kind of large scale cooperation we get in the Mycenaean period. This doesn't mean it's a horrible time for everybody. It just means it's a little, little different at the end of this period. Without any further ado, then, let's move into the big details. So this lecture is going to be about the archaeological sites themselves. The next lecture is going to be about warfare related finds. So armor, gear, weapons, a little bit about tactics. And the third lecture, I'm going to specifically address the Trojan War, the archaeology of the Trojan War, and what you need to know to make sense of the evidence from the epic tradition. That's our bridge topic that'll lead us into what we do in the next couple of units. Okay, ready? Here we go. I mentioned tablets, so here's what I mean. There are two different kinds of scripts that were used by people in the Greater Greece area in the Bronze Age. One called Linear A comes out of the island of Crete. We haven't deciphered it yet, no matter what the internet says. We just don't have enough of it to make a really good guess at what's on it. But I bring it up because the script that we use for Mycenaeans, um, Bronze Age people in the Greek mainland, is Linear B. And you may have wondered, well, where's Linear A? Here is Linear A. We don't know what this is about. However, Linear B was deciphered in the 1950s through a process that's super interesting but not relevant right now. So we're looking at Linear B tablets here, which I will circle in green. This is on the right side of your screen. Now these scripts were preserved much like clay tablets elsewhere because they were in a building that burned down and because clay bakes and when it bakes it's hard and it survives really well that means that those receipts survive but that's just a small percentage of the total amount of what we call paperwork they call clay work back in the day and receipts is a really good way to think about these because these are lists of who's paying what tribute to whom what people's jobs are what they're getting from the local lord and what they're giving to the local lord. This gives us an idea of how many specialized jobs this civilization could support, and, and quite a few, uh, including early civil engineers, inter alia, but also lords, kings, nobility, pharmaceutical manufacturers, and a lot of farmers. Most people in this culture are farmers, and these were used to keep records of who had paid their cut of their farming produce and who hadn't. So it's essentially taxes. Now this tells us a lot about the administration of the area, but it's a very incomplete kind of information. Like how much would people know about you if all they found was a couple random bags of your receipts? They know how much coffee you buy in a week but they wouldn't necessarily know what your religious beliefs look like in total what your culture is like although you can tell some uh, we do know about some gods and goddesses because religious bodies had an economic footprint we know for instance that dionysus is a god worshipped in this period we also know that linear b is written in a very early version of the greek language which was a bit of a surprise we thought that speakers of the Greek language came into mainland Greece in a huge invasion where they wiped out some kind of native population. This we have backed away from. So if anyone mentions Dorian invasions to you, you, you can feel superior because that's not a thing anymore. We don't think that happened. So these are early Greek people. They're speaking a version of early Greek. The alphabet isn't early Greek though. It's a syllabic alphabet. It's related to alphabets we see elsewhere in the Eastern Mediterranean. And it is a culture that's plugged into this larger economic network. It's also a culture that's very focused on moving products into centralized locations, 
using those centralized locations to trade abroad for luxury goods and then redistributing those luxury goods back down the food chain of power in order for certain people to keep their authority in this culture and to maintain cooperation from people lower down. These people are referred to as Wanakes in the Linear B record, so local warlords perhaps may be a way of thinking about them. Kings is another way that this is translated. I'm going to use kings here just out of convenience and to save you having to learn new vocabulary. Okay. So that is part of what's guiding our ideas about what we're going to see in the buildings we're looking at moving ahead here. Now we're also going to look at the geography a little bit here. In 1500 BCE or thereabouts, that's the period where these hilltop fortresses first start appearing and the earliest ones are out of an area called the Plains of Argos. So this is a flat-ish area in Greece, separated by a few small mountains and then more mountains higher around the edge. So it's kind of a bold depression with Reliable agriculture, seaside access, you notice Tiryns here is right on the seashore. In ancient times, the sea would have come up real close to Tiryns. So we think that Tiryns was built as a drop-off point and a loading dock for sea trade across into other parts of the eastern Mediterranean. So early on, we see these fortified central zones, people using Linear B artwork and artifacts that look very similar to each other. And these three fortified citadels, which seem to be networked to each other somehow. Now we don't know if they're part of a shared kingdom governance where the king is moving around a lot, whether they are competing hilltop fortresses, all of them vying for domination in the area or all of the above. It could be a variety of things we're still piecing this out. What we do know is that as time goes on, other parts of Greece begin to make similar structures. These hilltop constructions with large stones, with walls around them and storage areas for a lot of produce that are linked into trade networks and people are being buried with stuff that comes very far abroad. So things from Egypt, even like Upper Egypt, like of the area of modern Sudan, Mesopotamia, the Levant. So this is a really plugged in area. Pylos, by the way, is on this map because it's one of the earlier areas to start adopting the art and the alphabet and the culture. Now, we don't know if this was a process of collaborative cultural drift, whether people were uh, over time for economic reasons, adopting the same way of keeping records, or whether people living out of the plains of Argos were using warfare to conquer and dominate these other parts of the Greek mainland. Discussions are ongoing. We used to assume warfare and conquest, but we've backed up from that a little bit over time because that's an assumption and one that we don't have great smoke and gun evidence for. Most of the receipts are for cooperation and redistribution of stuff and the fortifications we're going to be looking at and here I'll give you the spoiler right up they aren't the kind of fortifications that would have been super effective against a large army so if the king of Egypt rolled up with his chariots and tried to invade the plains of Argos they could have done it it would have been achievable so why did that not happen? Well, this real estate isn't prime Eastern Mediterranean real estate. There are places like the Levant that are much more critical to conquer. You can still get nice stuff from the Greek mainland through trade without having to directly overtake it. It's also a very mountainous and broken up region. It's not so mountainous that trade isn't easy. In fact, trade between the different city-states of Greece continues right on through this period and beyond, long after 
linear B and palace complexes are falling into disuse, people are still trading over pretty long distances within the Greek mainland. But the mountains are rocky and forbidding enough that it's kind of difficult to use them as an invasion route. There isn't a lot of food for your army. You have to go over really rough terrain. Getting a chariot in there is hard. Even getting horses from one city state to the next is difficult. So cavalry is a novelty and a fancy sort of thing. We do see chariots used as a recreational vehicle for elites. But in terms of warfare, we don't see great evidence for the kind of large battles we're seeing in, say, Kadesh. This just isn't that exciting of a place. This is kind of a backwater by Eastern Mediterranean standpoints. But that works out really well for the civilization. They're dealing with smaller kinds of irritants, invading parties who are trying to loot your stuff, small groups of bandits, internal rebellions, perhaps. So these are fortifications that are fortifying against something. It's just the warfare context here. We can't assume that it looks like the kind of warfare context we were dealing with during Egypt and Mesopotamia units. We're looking now across the fields of Argos from the top of the hill on which the fortifications or walls on Mycenae stand. So here we're at the top of Mycenae and we're looking out. You can see today it's still a farming land. It will look dry to your eyes if you're used to Baltimore, but these are olive groves here now. With irrigation, you can farm quite well through here. And this is still an agricultural rural area. The same is true for areas north of Athens. Um, I mentioned Dr. Lane, I'll do it again. He excavates in Gla, which is one such site. So this is a nice area to farm. And it's also a very convenient area to keep an eye on from a central location because it's a bit of a basin, but within this basin, there are a lot of medium sized hills that stick up from the ground just enough that if you stand on top of them, you can look down and see everybody farming for a couple miles around you. And if you look the other way from here, you can look out to the sea. It's a very convenient place to set up a monitoring and collections hub. So that's probably why we see such things here. This is the view from Tiryns to Mycenae. And this is right at the top of that formerly harborside hill. Um, let me draw on this in blue. I think that'll show up nicely. So the sea is this away over here. And here where I've got the orangish color, that's further inland. So up the valley, this away, it takes you up the valley. So we're looking here from the top of Tiryns across the expanse of the plains of Argos, um, here to the ancient site of Argos, behind this mountain range also is Mycenae. You can see Mycenae from Argos. So one of the suggestions for what's going on here is that these high places may have had some kind of signaling system so that if, say, some sketchy boats like Sea Peoples sail into Tiryns Harbor, you can light a beacon on the top of Tiryns and then all down the line, Mycenaeans are like, whoa, we're being invaded, we should like lock the doors. So that might be some of what's going on here, a cooperative network of fortified areas. There are some problems with that, though, that we'll get into when we look at the fortifications themselves. Be that as it may, the evidence suggests that the kinds of incursions that folks were dealing with in this region were not the kinds you were in the Levant. The king of Egypt is not showing up with a bunch of chariots coming to invade you, um, nor the Hittites. You don't have a Mesopotamian potentate sailing across the sea to go get some Greek real estate. For the most part, 
what folks seem to be defending against are small raiding parties, perhaps raiding parties unaffiliated with this local socioeconomic network. You may also get smaller raiding parties coming in from the sea, so our, our sea peoples, again, are a likely demographic that these defenses are made for. But then also what might be going on with these large walls, and they are indeed very large impressive walls, is the optics of the thing. Because building a wall isn't necessarily about the practicalities of a wall being in front of an army coming at you. Walls are intimidating. If you want to rustle some cattle and you see a giant wall made out of boulders, you may decide that to this isn't the nut you want to try to crack. You may want to go down the valley to somebody who doesn't have giant boulder walls and a lot of people standing guard over them. That's the most likely scenario for what's going on here. These are walls meant to impress. They're also a sign that the people dominating these structures command a large workforce. You need to have an organized society and a high level of compliance to get people to build you these kinds of structures. Like if I were to go out and try to have somebody build a citadel, well, first I'd be in trouble because my apartment complex doesn't let you build citadels in it. Also where, where would I put my citadel? But then two, I think even if I gave you guys all the extra credit in the world and there wasn't a plague on, I would have a very hard time getting you to build me a citadel. Although, if you want to build me a citadel, I'm not going to say no either. So if you're somebody who can get people to build you these giant hilltop structures, you are a person with influence. We also see this in their burials, which uh, we're not going to spend too much time with, but the people in control of these areas are being buried with a lot of gold, a lot of artifacts that have been brought in from abroad, like Egyptian stuff. Babylonian stuff, stuff from the Levant, Hittite stuff. Like they have a lot of trade goods and they have so many trade goods that they can bury people with them. And not just adult people who may have lived a long enough life to endear themselves as rulers, but children. And when children are buried with lots of gold along with adults in a population of you know, just a few people, these grave circles don't have you know, we're talking like 20, 30 bodies max in these tombs near these areas. Likely, we're looking at a single family and we're looking at a governmental structure that includes some kind of hereditary title. Those kids don't have to build the reputation from scratch, rather because your parents are kings and their grandparents and so on, that power is inherited. This is the norm elsewhere in the ancient Near East, so this is a, a pretty decent hypothesis for who these people are and why their kids are being buried coated in gold. And I'm being very literal here. They actually coated some of their toddlers in gold when they buried them. It's really sad. They're, they're so tiny. Okay, so keeping all that in mind, let's look at Tyrans. Here are the walls I was talking about in Tyrans. This kind of masonry is called, in some circles, Cyclopean masonry. This is because later generations living in Greece seeing these walls thought that the boulders are so big, humans couldn't have lifted them. You needed a cyclops to be able to lift them. Cyclops is a mythological creature from Greek mythology with a single eye in the middle of their forehead. They're also very big and they build stuff for people in myth times for reasons. They're associated with Poseidon, the god of earthquakes. That's uh, also the sea. The two are related. If you've ever thought about tsunamis for a while, you'll understand why earthquakes and the sea get tied together in one god in this area. And remember, we're in the Aegean Sea where tsunamis and earthquakes happen a lot. So we are pretty darn sure that literal cyclopses did not build these walls. Sorry about that. But you do need 
complicated engineering and a lot of people's effort to be able to build walls that look like this. They're super impressive and many of them were built so that the stones were still showing on a lot of surfaces. Other surfaces were covered with plaster and artwork. Either way though, whether you have really nice artwork on your walls or you have giant boulders or both, this is a power move, a power display. In a functional defensive wall, however, you don't want to leave this kind of surface bare. Looking at this wall, you can see why. If I had a grappling hook and a ladder, it would not be an uncomplicated project to try to scale this wall. If you have enough people invading this wall, they're gonna be able to get in. It would have been a lot higher in the past, but not too much higher. These aren't more than three people tall. I've got a colleague in front of this wall so you can see what I mean by that. Mm. Now, this hallway we're looking down on the left, let me uh, scribble on it so you see what I mean, is a kind of arch form called a corbelled arch where instead of making a curved arch, we don't think that was an engineering feat possible or invented yet, Instead, where you've gotten above head space, you build each layer of rocks a little closer to each other and a little closer until they meet in the middle at the top. This relieves pressure coming down from the roof and creates a very stable ceiling. So stable, in fact, that we are looking down right now a hallway in Tiran's that has survived since the Bronze Age. That's pretty darn good. So gold star. But if you look at the outside of this hallway, you can see a series of open windows and not particularly narrow open windows either. And they're not distant enough that arrow volleys couldn't get into them. So they're somewhat defensible, yes, but by, say, Hittite standards, these These are walls that seem to be built more for optics and less for functional defense against large armies. Here we are at the top of this, the Hill of Tirans, where there are a number of structures, including these large jars. You can see them half buried in the ground. That's where they should be. This is a refrigeration method you use to store grain. It keeps the grain from spoiling because inside the pottery buried in the ground, everything stays at room or at sorry at uh, ground temperature. So if you're keeping wheat from sprouting but you want to keep it alive so you can plant it later, this is the kind of thing you keep it in. Other kinds of jars can be used to keep olive oil, wine, perfumes. Some of these complexes get quite large and have early versions of um, large scale luxury good production centers. Perfumes are a big one, woolworks, dyes, uh, as well as some pharmaceutical items, olive oil. And so there are a lot of trade goods ma being manufactured specifically for trade abroad in a larger network of Bronze Age, Bronze Age civilizations. Another interesting thing, and it may not look like much, so here is a drain that's in this kind of tub area at the top of Tiran's. This drains to the outside of the citadel. This is a way that you can drain water from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill without it sitting in place and damaging the stonework. So they had figured out a certain amount of plumbing. There are also jars where you can keep water for a long period of time, and that's useful because if you have to hole up in your citadel, you want to be able to have enough food and water to last for a while. Now that said, Tiran's is not that huge. You can walk from the bottom to the top of Tiran's easily in five minutes, like super easily. Taking a bunch of ancient study students from UMBC, stopping to look at stuff, it still took us like 10, 15 minutes. And it's about the size, uh, footprint wise, of the top of the hill where the Performing Arts Building sits. Like, Tiran's itself is not even as big as the Performing Arts Building. Maybe like 
half of the first two floors of the pub. Maybe you're like uh, half the fine arts building is about the size of Tiran's. So this isn't a city by our standards. It's not a place where everybody from the countryside can come stay for months on end. It, this is not that kind of a structure. So don't automatically go to the feudalism place with this. Now, a few words about that entrance to Tiran's I was mentioning. Here we are coming up the path sloping gently up from what used to be the port. Uh, now it's just dry land. You drive up there. But back in the day, you would have had your docks down the hill and slowly climbed your way up into this spiraling entrance that goes, you draw the spiral in blue like this up to the top of the hill. And within these stones lining this entrance, there are some niches and some checkpoints. We also see evidence of multiple gates. So of all of these citadels, this is the one with the most legit fortifications. These are fortifications that would have made it very difficult to break into this area. And that makes sense from an economic standpoint, because this is where luxury goods from the sea are coming in and being stored before they move on to their next destination. So you do want this to be a pretty beefily fortified area. Similarly, the way that this wall is curving makes it so that your sword arm, your right arm, and most people during this period were right handed uh, left-handedness goes up over time interestingly so your sword arm would have been on the inside edge of the wall whereas people defending would have had their sword arm facing this wall so you can reach around and stab but coming back up the other way uh, not so much oh hi hey little man yeah there's a baby with hiccups he is going to help tell you more about Tiran's and its fortifications. Okay. Also along these walls, there are some pinkish colored stones that seem to act as direction lines. And this is something that you don't see in fortifications that are meant solely to keep people out, right? You don't give people directions to the boss's office if you expect them to be invading and that's part of your design. So what we think this is, is a controlled access point for dropping off goods and walls that'll keep people from raiding the nice stuff before the king gets a hold of it. And say hi students, Jimmy. Okay. Yeah, that's Tyrants. Very exciting. So here we are deeper into the fortification at Tyrants, where some helpful UMBC students are showing you scale. If you look on the side of the wall here, and this is on the outer edge, there's this recess. We're not sure what this is for, but this may have been a garrison point. This is between two areas with large gates. So this might have been a place where you could close the gates, stop somebody coming in, and then have somebody jump out of the wall to go get them. But again, we're not sure. There also might have been a shrine there or a statue or some artwork or a fountain or a cupboard. Our information's a little sketchy. But this does give you an idea of how high the walls are at Tiran's, and they are quite high. Um, this is about as big as they get in this period. Now I was mentioning gates is, to give you an idea of what these gates look like. We have a UMBC student. They are standing right at the edge of the gates next to one of the holes where a bar would have gone to close the gate and make it hard to go into. Um, interestingly, though, this bar is on the um, out, sorry, um, inside edge of the door. So here's the recess where the hinges would have been. So you have a hinge here, a hinge here at the top, and then these doors open inwards so like uphill so if somebody was say trying to batter down this door with a ram they could have an easier time of breaking through because the door already swings that way however 
this is a convenient way to set up your doors if you have people bringing trade goods up the hill and you don't want the doors to slam on them. I will say that if you need to close the doors quickly, this is also a nice arrangement. Gravity will help you and you can batten it down well. So, you know, it's it's not the worst idea, but you know, these aren't the most practical doors. Also, they're a little bit angled. You can see on this door jam, they're bending towards a, a bit of a corbelled arch. Um, now, bits are broken off, but this looks really nifty. But we have some questions about how well this would do at keeping people out. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're very helpful. Now, moving to the more famous cousin of Tyrans. This is the one you've probably heard about. We're looking at Mycenae. This is a city that is identified from ancient times with a mythological Khan. This is one of the main Greeks in charge of the alleged Greek invasion of Troy. We'll unpack that later. But if you're remembering that name, that's probably why. And here we are looking from an airplane down on it. And again, you can see agricultural land spreading out around. You can't see from here the grave circles around the area, but there are a lot of elite wealthy tombs around this city, less so in other cities in the region. So it's not unreasonable to conclude that this is the place where political power is situating itself and imposing its will elsewhere. Maybe not full on imperialism, but you know, this is the fancy place. But it's also quite small. And even without great scale, you can see from just looking at the footprint of buildings here. So this is like the downtown area of Mycenae. There are some firm foundations here for a structure we call a megaron, which is a combination between a gathering space. We think that this would have been a place where uh, local elites would greet and redistribute goods. So kind of sort of a throne room, but it's not a huge structure by and large. And a lot of the rooms here are for storage. Even elsewhere in this complex, you have areas for storage. And there's just not enough room here for more than a couple families to live full time. And we do find remnants of housing outside of the wall around this area. And this wall isn't at its full height. It's been partially reconstructed, but we're still missing chunks of the wall and it was moved at different times. There's also a little bit more real estate here at the back, including a cistern. So there's a set of steps you can go down to get to an underground chamber where you can keep a safe water supply. So there is some facilities set up for military situations. Also, there's a back door escape hatch. Pro tip, if you are fortifying your own hillside at any time in the future, make sure that you have a back way out. It's a really good idea because you, you don't want to get yourself stuck too much. The front gate into Mycenae comes around this way there's a sloping road let me use another color we'll go with green here so the sloping road goes around the edge up into the citadel proper this side also doesn't have particularly great walls there is a gate and around this gate there is an extension of the wall so that people could stand over the gate and keep you away from it but there aren't a lot of features that would be really helpful if a full-on army was invading. Again, it looks like this is something that's meant to keep back smaller raiding parties. Now around the side of the wall that we're looking at here, the wall is much steeper and better built. There are also a lot of angles. That is a good defensible choice. Projections out from the wall allow you to station people in such a way that if folks are trying to use ladders to board, you can attack them from the side. If you're building your own defensive fortifications, curves are your friends. And if you create nooks and crannies, 
making them into traps that you can drop things on people's heads from is a good compromise. I don't know who needs to hear that, but I hope that's useful information to you. Now about that gate, these are pictures taken coming into the Citadel of Mycenae. Switch back to my blue. So on this side of the gate is the city proper. So this is the roadway leading up and it is on an angle that's important. If you want to try to knock this gate down, you have to walk uphill to do it and it's a really long walk uphill. So you will see people coming along before they get to this gate. On this side, the city wall has been extended forward a little bit. We don't know quite what the structure on the top of this was, whether it was covered at all, but at the very least, there do seem to be walkways so that in the area immediately in front of the gate, um, say if this person in the hat who's just about to reach the Lion Gate here, it's uh, Dr. Daniel Levine from Arkansas, if he were to be attacking, then rocks could be thrown on his head, fire could be rained down from above, and you could choke him off and uh, cause trouble for him. What this does seem to be doing, though, is giving a very impressive view to anybody who's coming in to visit. There would have been a wooden door installed, and we know what it looked like because the fittings, the places where the door leaves go, are still visible in the walls. This is a reconstruction of one such door. So what's left in the doors today are the holes on either side where the beam would have been put across to keep the door shut. And then the hinge posts here, 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 and there at the bottom. I can't draw in because my head's in the way. I'll try. So let's look at how these doors functioned. I'm oh, sorry, here we're looking from the inner city downwards. And I've got a slide in a minute to show you what this looks like in practice. So from the inside of the city looking down, this is kind of an, there are some advantages to what's in the city here. So you enter this gate and the first thing you see are the graves of a previous generation of wealthy people. That's an interesting, an interesting choice. In some ways, kind of brilliant, because if somebody gets through this gate, the first thing they're gonna end up in is your graveyard. And the rest of the city is up the hill, even from here. So you have another opportunity to go attacking them. So defensibility wise, it's not a bad choice, but it's also a really strange thing to fortify. This wall continues all the way around to fortify a graveyard. This is a culture that takes respecting the dead very seriously, but this isn't the only tomb in the area. There are a lot of tombs that don't get put inside the walls. This has led some people to wonder, you know, maybe the wall isn't just about being a defensive structure. Maybe the wall is about saying who lives here, who they're related to, where their authority comes from, and why you should pay them your taxes. If they're the descendants of these shiny, people who got buried with gold and they're taking over and they want you to give them your produce, then you might be persuaded that they're worthy of your produce because, well, gosh, they've got this big citadel, the walls, they're their ancestors right there. So walls aren't just about keeping people out. Walls are about making a power statement. And sometimes the point of the wall is that it's there, not that it's effective. So to show you what I mean, here are some very poorly drawn MS paint drawings. Uh, this isn't of Tyrans, this is of Mycenae. And Mycenae has you going uphill. You can see the edge of the wall. I'm gonna use my blue pen here. Oh, no, that's my red pen. Here, the grave circles are right here. I'll put them here, there's a second. So this is showing the doors when they're open. The hinges are here and here. The individual leaves of the door open and then they fold into the wall. So they're out of the way when it's open. When it's closed, 
again, going downhill, the leaves are shut, and then the red bar shows where the bolt is holding the doors into place. So this is great if you just need to keep raiders from breaking down your door, but unlike Tyrans, we are curving uh, counterclockwise, yeah? Our uphill curve is going this way, so your invader's sword arm is a lot more free than is your defender's sword arm. You're coming down this hill, there's a big wall here. You're going to have a little bit of trouble defending this conventionally, which is why we brow raise a little bit at these doors. Better doors exist elsewhere in the Bronze Age. They had options, and this is what they chose. And da da da. Yes, we're almost done. And that's it. We're done with part one. In part two, we're going to talk about Mycenaean arms and armor and possible battle techniques. But right now, somebody wants to go eat and or play with his truck. So I'm going to go do that now. Be well, stay classy, and I will see you on the next episode of Unit 3.